Good morning, this is Dr. Imam with Cure Allergy Clinic. And in this video, I'm gonna explain how asthma inhalers work. Now, in future videos, I'll go into more detail on why we use certain types of inhalers versus other types of inhalers. What is it with all the different brand names of inhalers? But as of right now, we're gonna go through the general classes of inhalers and how they work. And we're gonna focus specifically right now for asthma, but you will see a lot of overlap with chronic bronchitis or emphysema. So to start off, we first have to understand what is going on with asthma and what are we trying to reverse with the inhalers. So this is a very general picture that we're seeing right now of a person with their lungs. And right now we have their nose that they're breathing in through, we have their trachea, and then we have this goes down into their bronchus. So essentially, we have air enters this area and then goes down into the lungs in this direction. Now, our goal is um, to get in air as we need it, depending on the circumstance. And normally what happens at this area right here, the bronchus, these should increase in width when we need more air in, and then when we don't need the air, they decrease in width. And what happens with asthma is that instead of increasing, they just don't respond. This increase of risk of the bronchus, we call bronchodilation. And this decrease, we call bronchoconstriction. Now, this airway right here, this is the inside of the airway. So if we kind of cut it here, we end up with the inside of this airway. Right here, if this area starts to narrow, we start having decreased airflow. And if we have decreased airflow, the person starts getting shorter breath. And that decreased airflow, just like a whistle, you can start to hear that whistle, and we call that whistle wheezing, essentially. Now, if wheezing gets so bad, or this area gets so closed down, you'll stop hearing any wheezing. And that we call that absent breath sounds. And that's actually worse than wheezing because we kind of go from normal breath sounds and then we go a little less until we get wheezy and then we go into less until we don't hear anything at all. And that's usually when a person's really short of breath and might require a trip to the emergency room, which we're trying to prevent. Now, normally what needs to happen is a person's chest expands and that will decrease the volume in this area, and it'll, sorry, it'll increase the volume in this area and decrease the pressure. So the pressure inside the lungs will be low compared to the outside. And when that occurs, air will start to flow into the lungs and we inhale. And that's essentially how inhalation occurs. So now, What's happening here is that we have narrowing of the airway, so it's difficult to get in air, but it also becomes difficult to get air out because we also need to get carbon dioxide out of our body. And that causes um, kind of a form of obstruction or difficulty getting air out. So anytime we're trying to deal with this, um, with asthma, that's what most of the inhalers are trying to, uh, to, to, to prevent. So let's take a closer look. So right now, we have these bronchus. So right now, the bronchus that comes down this airway, this is a cross section of that airway. And there's two things that are mainly occurring. The airway is going to constrict or bronchoconstrict when we need it to bronchodilate, or there's gonna be increased inflammation in the airways. But both of them end up with the same thing. We have a narrowing of the airway. So this is what we're trying to prevent. And the way we prevent this, we have two separate mechanisms. One mechanism is we want to introduce medications that are gonna prevent this constriction and keep the airways open. And then we wanna introduce another set of medication that decrease this inflammation in order for the airway to remain patent. So in order to understand that, the first thing we have to understand is two major receptors that are on the airways. The first receptor we're gonna call the beta receptors. The second receptor we're gonna call M for muscarinic receptors. The beta receptors are part of the sympathetic nervous system, which we're going to call SNS for sympathetic nervous system. These receptors, the muscarinic receptors, are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, what's the difference between these nervous systems? This is your rest and digest nervous system. And therefore, this is when we don't really need the added um, air, what it tends to happen is that this, when it gets activated, it activates the M receptors and that causes bronchoconstriction or narrowing of the airway. The sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight response. And when this activates, it tends to cause bronchodilation by activating the beta receptors. 
So in summary, when we activate the beta receptors, we increase the uh, we increase the section of the lumen of the bronchus and we increase airflow. And if we activate the muscarinic receptors, we decrease airflow. So any good inhaler needs to activate this one and it needs to inhibit this one. And that goes for asthma. And that'll solve the problem of bronchoconstriction that we have over here. The other problem we have is this inflammation, this thickening of the airway over here that's occurring. And the way we do that is we have to use something that's anti-inflammatory, in which case we use something called inhaled corticosteroids, also known as ICS. And these medications take time to work. So there's something that someone would normally have to do daily in order to get this inflammation down. And that combination will control the, uh, the, uh, the narrowing of the lumen and allow more air to enter and exit. So the first class are right here. We call these medications beta agonists, and an agonist is something that activates something. So essentially, we're going to call these beta agonists. Now, these are short-acting beta agonists, so for short, we call them SABA, or SABAs, which stands for short-acting beta agonist. Normally, these are all albuterol. So albuterol comes in different forms. So you might get albuterol like this in a pro-air inhaler, you might get albuterol in a ventilant inhaler, or you might get albuterol in a nebulizer treatment. But they all have the same result. They're all albuterol. And what albuterol is, it's a short-acting beta agonist. What it'll do is when you inhale it, this airway will just open up. And this will take effect in about 15 minutes but it'll last about four to six hours. So these are normally what we call rescue inhalers. And it is the first inhaler most people get if they have asthma or COPD, and they're told to use this inhaler as needed. Because it lasts four to six hours, we usually recommend it that it's used Q four to six hours, meaning every 46 hours, PRN, which means as needed for cough or shortness of breath or wheezing. People tend to call these rescue inhalers, and sometimes I don't like calling them rescue inhalers because that tends to mean to a person that they need to be really short of breath and really need a rescue before they start using it. But in reality, any shortness of breath, you can use this inhaler. Uh, and this is essentially how it works, pops it right open. So I like to compare these to a plunger. They help open up the airways quickly, but also they don't last for very long. They don't permanently open up the airways. So these are good during an acute attack but they're not good for a long-term medication. Normally, when we deal with asthma, we want to use these medications about once or twice a week. If a person requires them more than once or twice a week, that's when, we need, that's when it tells us the inflammation is becoming severe and they might need an added medication. That brings us to the second class of medications. So we have two classes here, one called the ICS and one called the LABA. Let's start with the ICS. The ICS stands for inhaled cortical steroid. Now, when we think of steroids, sometimes, you know, in the media, we might think of anabolic steroids, which, you know, certain bodybuilders might take. But that's not what type of steroid this is. This is a cortical steroid. And this is a steroid that's kind of like cortisol and decreases inflammation. And if this is inhaled, it'll go into that airway where we're having this thickening and it'll decrease that thickening. And with the decrease of the thickening, it'll help that airway open up and we'll have better airflow. These medications take a while to work. They're not really great as needed. Therefore, these are what we call maintenance medications. And we require that you take this inhaler every single day in order to decrease the inflammation in the airways and help a person breathe better. The other class of medications here, the LABA, that stands for a long acting beta agonist. So this is just like its brother up here, the short acting beta agonist, except for this one lasts four to six hours. These ones last up to more than eight hours. So therefore, a person can take this twice a day and kind of open up this airway for a longer period of time. Now, because asthma control, if a person's using this inhaler and it's not well controlled, we tend to not use these on their own. We tend to combine them in a two-in-one inhaler for, con for convenience. And those are the most popular inhalers that people tend to know about, uh, other than the albuterol. And that, that, those kind of look like this. Now there's more than these, I'm just putting these as an example, but these are what we call ICS, LABA combos. Okay, 
So this medication, this medication, all of them have both an inhaled corticosteroid and they have a long acting beta agonist. So just as a summary, the inhaled corticosteroid is going to decrease the inflammation and help open up the airway, while the long acting beta agonist is going to help pop open the airway so that it has more room. And the combination of the two should help. Now, again, these medications do not work that well as needed. So if you are already short of breath, your best bet is a short acting beta agonist or albuterol, which like we said, comes in Ventolin, Pro Air, or an nebulizer treatment. But these work better if you take them every single day. So normally they vary in how you take them. For example, this one, you would take once a day, the Brio. Dulera is twice a day, Adverse twice a day, the Wixilla is twice a day. Now there are other ones we will mention in more detail later on and why you would pick one over the other. Then the last class of drugs we're gonna mention here is the Llama. Now, if you remember, we had mentioned that there's two receptors on the airway. There's the beta receptor that's trying to open up the airway, and there's the muscarinic receptor which is trying to close the airway. Now, anything that helps this is gonna help us during asthma, and anything that stops this is gonna help us during asthma. So this is a lung acting muscarinic antagonist, and it tries to stop this from working. Now, this is, tends to be first-line treatment in COPD, emphysema, but in asthma, we tend to not use this until later on. So our course is, first, we want to start with the short-acting beta agonist, which is albuterol. Then our next step, if the asthma is still not well-controlled, is we do an ICS, which is a steroid, and this can be something like Flovent, QVAR, and there's other brands. I'm not mentioning all of them right now. If this isn't working, then we add in the LABA. So it becomes a LABA ICS combination. And that's like Advair, Dulera, Simbacor, Brio. And then if the asthma is still not controlled, then we add in a LABA. A LAMA, I'm sorry. And that's something like the increase right here that you're seeing. Now, normally, if a person gets to the point where they need a llama, their asthma is not controlled, and they need to find other reasons why that asthma is not controlled. So there could be triggers, which could be something like allergies, smoking, infection, anatomical problems, um, and such, which we can go into more detail later. Now, let's summarize. So we have a Saba. These are the medications that are as needed. They are something that we're going to use for relief, but they do not help us long term. And this is mainly albuterol. Then we have the Lama, the Labas, which are, they work the same as this one, but they last longer. They're also a little bit shorter on their onset, but they last for longer. And these are usually used with an inhaled corticosteroid. We have the inhaled corticosteroids, which decrease inflammation. And they also must be used daily, usually. And lastly, we have the llamas, which are usually for really bad control of asthma and less. And these also um, increase bronchodilation by decreasing the muscle receptors. So as you can see here, when it comes to all of these receptors, these must be used daily, these must be used daily, and these must be used daily when they're prescribed. This is the only one that's used as needed. So sometimes you might be given two red, uh, two red inhalers. You might be given an albuterol pro-air inhaler, which might look red, and then you might also be given a Simbacort, which might look red. And you might ask, well, why do I have two separate inhalers? Well, the reason is because you have three separate drugs. This is a, a short-acting beta agonist, and this is a combination ICS lava. And that's why. And that's how the inhalers work. Now we'll go into more detail on every all the different types of brands of inhalers and why we might use one over the other. But this is a general overview on how inhalers work. Now inhalers are not the only treatment for asthma. We'll go into more treatment, treatment options as well, including curing those allergies with desensitization, adding in possible biologics, which might decrease the source of what's causing the asthma, and uh, and um, I'm going to go into more detail on those later. Okay, well, thank you. I hope this was helpful.